Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're delighted you've made the time to come and join us in our worship this morning. Uh, with the restrictions still being in place, unfortunately, we're still prevented from coming together on the Bambridge Road. Uh, nevertheless, we thank the Lord that our church family can still meet, joined by God's Spirit, in the comfort of our own homes. I want to reiterate uh, that during these uncertain days of coronavirus, if you do happen to be struggling in any way, or you'd just like to talk to someone, or you feel you need help with something, uh, please don't hesitate to contact our church office on 02892698258. Just leave a message and someone will get back to you. Also, I issued an invitation last uh, Sunday morning for you to join us uh, for our online prayer time on Wednesday evening. I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in at half seven last Wednesday uh, because we are so conscious that as we live through these unprecedented days, we really do need to be seeking God's face and praying for his presence and his deliverance. Uh, we're going to be meeting again this Wednesday evening. Uh, details on how you can connect will be sent through the prayer line email address. Uh, if you're not receiving the prayer line emails, uh, again, just ring the office, 02892698258. And again, someone will be in touch with all the inf information uh, that you require. And we would truly love to see you uh, joining with us on uh, Wednesday evening. As we begin our worship, I want to uh, read a couple of verses from Psalm 47, where the psalmist writes this. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. So let's take a few moments to pray together as we come before that King in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence, we want to acknowledge that you are the one who is holy and righteous and just, and the one deserving of our worship and our praise and our honor and our glory. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. Before the earth was formed, you were. You are from everlasting to everlasting. And so we come before you today, Father, to exalt your name. You are good and your mercy endures forever, from generation to generation. There is no one like you. And so we do come to you in worship, and we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens are declaring your glory. And from our lips, we offer you the fruit of our praise. And we want to bless your holy name today. Heavenly Father, we come to you through that name that is above all names. We come to you through your son, Jesus, the one who is our Savior and our Lord. The one who has washed us from all our sins and cleansed us by his precious blood. And Sovereign Lord, we thank you that in worship we can put aside all the uncertainties of this world and we can rest for a few moments today on the certainties of your kingdom. Your promises never change. Your plan is eternal. Thank you, Lord, that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and the fears and the troubles that we face and we can leave them there knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we need at these moments. Father, we pray that we might be transported from a world that's full of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence. And today that we might find healing and wholeness and refreshment. Father, might we find your joy even in the midst of our trials. We pray that you would teach us what it means to see beyond our troubles, 
knowing that you are with us and you hold all things in your never-failing arms. So, Lord, bless this time that we share together today. Bless your word as a source of encouragement to all of our hearts. And we pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Now Elizabeth uh, is going to read to us from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms, and she's going to read Psalm 121. The Bible reading is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Folks, we haven't had a good laugh together on Sunday mornings now for uh, a number of weeks. Uh, so here's a few wee uh, one-liners to hopefully get you smiling this morning. They're all connected to mountains because I suppose that's really the theme of what I'm going to be talking about this morning as we look at Psalm 121 together. What's the laziest mountain? What's the laziest mountain? Mount Everest. <laughs> and then secondly, what's the most dangerous mountain? What's the most dangerous mountain? Think about that. Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> How are mountains able to see? They peak. Why are mountains so funny? Because they're hill areas. Hilarious. Get it? Hilarious. <laughs> so you're asking yourself, why all the mountain jokes? Well, because we're turning to the mountains or we're turning to the hills this morning, as we are going to take a few minutes to look together at Psalm 121. I think it's been rightly said that man's extremity is God's opportunity. And very often it's only when our earthly hopes fail that our hearts remember to look to the Lord. And I'm sure many of you will agree with that. For many of us over this past month, as we have lived through these uncertain and anxious days, we have looked to the Lord in ways that we have never, ever looked before. The psalmist in Psalm 121 says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. In Psalm 121, the psalmist first looks to the hills, which represent worldly sources of hope. John Calvin, in his six-volume commentary on the Psalms, explains, by the hills, the psalmist means whatever is great in the world. But when hope there fails, the psalmist asks a question that is only one true answer. Where does my help come from? And folks, the only help sufficient to meet our needs, whatever those needs might be, is from the Lord. When we're desperately ill, we look up to the towering medical center, but after the operation, when the medicines have been taken, and when the hope inspired by doctors and technology has been exhausted, well, then it's to the Lord that we very often turn. In economic uncertainty, we gaze up to the city's skyscrapers of our world's financial centers, 
But we must remind ourselves that our future cannot be secured from the business institutions that have their high offices there. And in the midst of international crises, we look to the high places of government and power. But really, folks, is this where our hope truly lies? I think recent history has shown us no. So where then is our help? Well, in fear, in doubt, in trouble, and in pain, we come to the comforting realisation that God alone is the one on whom we can and must always depend. Psalm 121 brings before us the truth that when all other help fails, as happens so often, God is sure and faithful, and he will be there to help those who truly trust him. Psalm 121 is a psalm of ascents, as the superscription tells us. That means it was probably one of the psalms sung by Old Testament Jews as they made their climb or their pilgrimage up to the holy city of Jerusalem for their religious feasts. And the reason this psalm is so dear to pilgrims today, to those of us who in our lifetimes journey at times into darkness and danger, is its insistence on the certainty of God's protection. Its key word is the Hebrew word shamar, which occurs six times in verses 3 to 8. The English Standard Version of the Bible translates this the same way each time using the word keep. Other versions, such as the NIV, use both keep and watch. And the idea is of God as our guardian or our protector. People like to think at times that they have a guardian angel. It makes them feel safe to think that someone's there constantly watching over them. Psalm 121 directs you and me to someone who is much greater. A guardian God who watches over and who keeps and protects each of his own as we travel through this very uncertain world. And probably no story in the Bible dem demonstrates this more clearly than that of Jacob, who became the father of the nation of Israel. We all know how he wronged his brother Esau, and after he did that, he had to flee for his safety. Uh, running alone in the wilderness, he had no pillow for his head. Uh, he, he had no bed but the cold earth. He was a very fearful, lonely traveler. But God came to him, and God said to him, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And likewise, folks, you and I can be certain of God's guardian care too, until his promises of a complete salvation are fully accomplished in our lives. The psalmist in verse 2 reminds us, that while every sort of worldly aid is limited and uncertain, God is the great creator, the great creator of absolutely everything, and the one who is infinite in power and might. And this is why we can find unfailing help in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The psalmist here is making a contrast between the creation and the creator. On the one hand, we see the hills and all that they represent. And let me just emphasize at this stage that it's important to note that this psalm doesn't teach that we should shun every kind of earthly help that we can receive. Believers should go to doctors and they should take their medicines. We should invest prudently for our retirement and we should pray for godly leaders in government. But we must remember that all of these are merely created things and we must contrast them to the power and the strength of our creator. Every high mountain, every tower, and every pinnacle of earthly achievement is a finite limited thing. However powerful, there's a limit to its might or its availability. But none of this can be said of the God of the Bible, who is the maker of all things. So, folks, when we find our eyes scanning the hills, we need to lift our sight even higher to a greater and more glorious source of help, 
one who is more sure and one on whom we can completely depend on. This reference to God as creator not only provides a contrast with all creation, but also points to the ease with which God is able to help us in all our times of need. God created by his mere word. God himself is not part of the creation. God doesn't share its limitations in any way. God is in all places at all times. God sees and he knows all things simultaneously. God can give his full attention to a needy believer in one far off corner of the globe, whether that's Pastor Emma in Uganda or James and Heather Cochran in Portugal, without being at all distracted from the danger or trouble confronting you and me here in Dromore. And the wisdom with which he considers our difficulties is the very same wisdom that formed molecules and assembled stars. Almighty power is at God's command. So the help that comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, is all we could ever need and far, far more. In all of this, God is exalted as the only true God. And this, folks, is the reason he demands the exclusive worship of our hearts. Therefore, we're wise to become acquainted with him because he is the source of our help and our hope. And by knowing him, we can experience peace in troubles and we can truly be filled with joy in the midst of trials. Now, having reminded us that God is the creator, the psalm goes on to speak of his vigilance in protecting his people. Verse 3 says, he will not let your foot slip. Try to imagine a Judean pilgrim wending his way up that path that leads to the city of Jerusalem. How easily his foot might slip in those primitive roads and those rock-strewn paths. And we can extend this idea to misfortune of every kind, to sudden changes that come along and threaten us, to cast us down, to hinder our progress. But God is always there to put his hand on us and steady his people. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The picture is that of a caravan, an eastern group of travelers all traveling together that has set up camp for the night. As darkness falls, the sentries are posted uh, but they only do their job effectively if they remain awake and they're ready. If they fall asleep, they put themselves and they put everybody else in danger. Folks, our guardian God neither slumbers nor sleeps when darkness gathers all around us. We've all been there. Those periods of darkness, those times when we just can't see any way ahead for us. Maybe threatening voices are there in our heads intimidating us. When we're vulnerable, we're just like these sleeping travelers. And in such times, this psalm tells us that we are assured that God is still with us. Though the darkness might hide him, and though our own weariness causes our eyes to close, God is still there. Whatever the circumstances into which God has led us, we can rest ourselves peacefully under his care. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The danger from the sun's harsh rays is obvious, and the reference here to the moon may well be connected to the popular uh, ancient belief that its rays were spiritually harmful. The word lunatic derives from luna, the Latin word for the moon. So the teaching here is that God cares for his people by shielding them as they travel along life's journey. This might well recall the time of the Exodus, when for 40 years the Israelites journeyed through that harsh desert environment. God was teaching them in those 40 years to depend on him for absolutely everything. Their food was the manna that he sent down from heaven. He also provided water for his thirsty people from the flinty rocks. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night were always present with them. 
It showed them when to move and where to go. When it stopped, they stopped. When it moved, they moved. And this was their life of faith. And folks, what an example for us. A people ready to follow as and when God directs. In the heat of the day too, the clouds spread out above them as a canopy over their heads, which was, of course, a shade to comfort and protect. Sinai Desert is one of the most hostile climates on earth. During the day, the temperatures climb to well over 100 degrees. When darkness falls at night, it might well plunge to well below freezing. God sent his people to pass through this hostile environment. And likewise, he leads us through this wilderness world before our entry into that promised land in glory. He shades and he comforts and he protects. You know, in biblical terms, this present life isn't a playground, but it is a spiritual wasteland. If God didn't provide for us and shield us, folks, we would perish. In this way, he teaches us to trust him, to draw near to him, and to receive all our help from his hands. As in the days of Israel's ancient history, so today, the Lord is your shade at your right hand, and the sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. And then the final two verses of the psalm sum everything up. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Again, I emphasize every kind of danger and hardship that we experience comes to us under God's guardian eye. Throughout the whole of our life, from the moment that we are born to the moment that we die, in all our comings and goings, the Lord is ready at hand to ensure that no real harm comes to us. Now, I wonder, as you sit there this morning, do you truly believe that? Do you honestly think that this is a claim that we can really rely on? Do these assurances square up with the experience of life as, as you know it? Folks, understand that this psalm doesn't promise us an absence of troubles, but rather it assumes troubles. From the beginning, it acknowledges our need of help. Where does my help come from? Life is difficult. You don't need me to tell you that. Life is difficult. And Christians can't bypass the troubles endemic to a fallen world of sin. Some of us will get sick and some of us will suffer pain and real pain at that. Some of our hearts will be broken in two through circumstances that are just beyond our control. So how then can the claims of this psalm be a comfort to us? Well, the answer is simply... While all of what I've just said is true, none of these things can really do any harm to the one who's fully trusting in God. Why? Well, I say again, because the almighty sovereign God of the universe is our guardian, folks. And in love, he watches over us and he wants to keep us from all harm. I think the Apostle Paul put this best in Romans 8 when he catalogues every kind of possible harm but proceeds then to assure us that we cannot be separated from God's saving love. We all know these verses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, if you've lifted your eyes and looked up to the hills, 
but have then realized that only God can deliver you and that he sent Jesus to be your savior in whom you can now trust. Then don't allow yourself to doubt the claims of this great psalm. Jesus Christ died for us. He gave his own blood to save us from death and hell and to secure us for himself. Surely the sacrificial, sin-atoning death of the Son of God won't fail to accomplish all the gracious, saving purposes for which the Father designed it and for which the Son made it. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 says of Jesus, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he entered into his present priestly ministry that further guarantees our safety. Jesus is the guardian of this psalm, the Savior and the Lord who watches over our lives and who preserves us. But is he your Savior and your Lord? If he's not, well, then you need to come to him in humble repentance and trust in his eternal life-giving power. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.